Welcome to this final installment in James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. In the first couple of editions, we've talked about the wisdom which is fleshly. It's from the earth. It speaks more to the values of the, the age of which we live than that which is eternal and given to us by the Spirit of God. It results in every evil thing and disorder. But then it's contrasted in verse 17 and 18, which I'll read in just a moment, by the word but. In fact, I would suggest that you take a look back at verse 14 and see that in verse 14, it begins that segment which talks about those who possess a wisdom which is of the earth, which is, if you will, demonic, and which is leading to that which is unstable and everything which is evil. Let me suggest to you that that contrast with verse 13, who is the wise and then the understanding person among us, is going to be demonstrated by the meekness, the gentleness, the grace of their wisdom. And now in verses 17 and 18, the word but is used to introduce our, our ears and our eyes to the wisdom which is of God. I read for you in verse 17 and 18 from the English Standard Version. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. I'm sure you've noticed in verse 17 that there are seven different attributes or characteristics given of divine wisdom there. Seven, many people think, is the, the perfect number. It speaks to, if you will, not only God's perfection, but the completeness of something. Well, let's just take a look at these very briefly. First of all, it's purity. That I'm going to suggest to you, just as I believe there is one fruit of the Spirit, love, which demonstrates itself in joy and peace and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. I'm going to suggest to you that the foundational piece of the wisdom of God is, first of all, pure. It is free of defilement. It is, if you will, indispensable to those of us who desire to be seen as the wise woman or the wise man. It speaks to, if you will, both motive and means. Secondly, it's peaceable. As opposed to every evil thing and disorder that's seen for us in verses 15 and 16, as we talk about the wisdom of this life, the wisdom of this age, here we have it's peaceable. You'll recall in Romans chapter 12 and verse 18 that Paul writes to the church at Rome, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. There's so much clamor. There's so much dissent. There are so many angry voices shouting in the streets of our culture, shouting over the airwaves of our television sets, dominating, if you will, technological channels. What the world needs now is not just love, sweet love, to use the words of an old song, but the world needs now a wisdom that is pure and is demonstrated in a spirit of peace. Third, it's gentle. The word gentle there has the idea of being a strong person, but under the control of another. It's used, for example, of a, of a cult that has been broken by its owner. It has a beautiful history to it. But for our purposes, gentleness is not just the choice of the words that we use. Proverbs 15.1 says that the harsh words cause quarrels, but a gentle answer turns away wrath. But gentleness is a disposition. It demonstrates itself not just in the way in which we use our words, but the way in which we live our life. Fourth, it's said to be reasonable. Very simply, there is a willingness to listen to both sides of any issue. Proverbs 18 verse 17 says this, that any story sounds straight until you get both sides. There is a reasonableness which does not make demands and does not argue to be right, but listens so as to understand. Fifth, it's full of mercy and good fruits. Full of mercy 
and good fruits. Sixth, it's unwavering. It has fixed principles to it. Just as the word of God is our final authority, just as the word of God offers not just, if you will, commands but and, and precepts, but principles as well, but they're fixed. And then finally, the wisdom which is from God is without hypocrisy. One of the best definitions I've ever read is faith is living without scheming. You go back and look at the story of Jacob in the book of Genesis, and you'll look at a life that, while ultimately redeemed, was a life of scheming. And the fruit that he bore from that would not have been in keeping with God's intent. So while the anger of man does not demonstrate the righteousness of God, we see that in an earlier place of scripture, allow me to leave this time together with reading to you a very famous prayer that was penned for us by St. Francis of Assisi. You'll recognize it, I'm sure. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith, and where there is darkness, light. When there is despair, hope, and when there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Wise words from a wise man. I have a strong suspicion that St. Francis of Assisi was shown in the wisdom of his actions, the fruit of verses 17 and 18. God bless you, and we'll see you again on the next Moments with Mike.